All right, it's finally here. So now comes probably the hardest part, putting it together. to start so I'm just gonna start It does actually come with instructions. So that was one of my biggest fears. Let's see how readable they are. Well, they have the quality of a 90s Xerox, but it's better than nothing, I guess. All right, got the crane stupidly suspended with straps for now, but it'll do. All right, well, it is all out of the package now. And uh, it's funny, when I was talking to the manufacturer, when it was on the Pacific, I actually asked to get a PDF of the instructions ahead of time, so I knew what I was in for. And the reply I got was, don't worry, there's actually not much to put together. I'm gonna go ahead and call that a misleading statement. That said, I actually don't think it's gonna be too bad. I'm gonna head in town to get some supplies and some caffeine, and uh, hopefully I can put this together tonight. Uh, if not, then I'll finish it up tomorrow morning. All right, well, that was some classic over-optimism. Uh, as soon as I got back from town, we had about 40 days and 40 nights of rain, and uh, it still hasn't stopped, as you can see. It's just colder now, so it's snowing. Nonetheless, I managed to get this together. It took about two days. None of it was very difficult, but it was tedious. Uh, the, crane, the crane came in one solid piece, except for the base here, but we had to take off all the individual hoses and uh, disconnect all the you know, different articulations in order to be able to carry it to move it into place properly. Then you have to reattach all the hoses. Luckily, they are all labeled with letters. Um, it does come with diagrams and schematics, of course, but it was all labeled, so it was all pretty easy to put together. It was just a matter of doing it. Uh, and I did actually have my brother come and help me, uh, thankfully, because it would have taken a lot longer without a second person there. Nonetheless, I got it here there was a bunch of delays behind shipping, but it's finally arrived, it's functional, um, and in many ways it's better quality than I expected. So first off, what exactly is this? Well, if you watch any videos from forestry or logging in Europe, you may have seen this. What this is, is it's a small forwarding trailer, essentially, that can be attached to a small tractor. And so in Finland and Sweden and then other places like, I think, Germany and the Czech Republic, uh, there are a lot of different manufacturers of these things. You can find them everywhere. There's Cranman, uh, Vava Yusi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Avesta, which I think was bought out a few years back. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of different producers and they're readily available. In the United States, they're pretty much non-existent. Actually, across the border in Canada for me, about an hour east, there is a guy, he has a YouTube channel, who did manage to find a Cranman. He lives in New Brunswick. I, I tried looking in my area to see if I could find something of the sort. I couldn't. I have actually seen Scandinavian manufacturers at uh, the local logging expo that comes every two years. But when I've asked them for prices, uh, you know, they would tell me in a very thick Finnish accent, 30,000 which is a bit more, we'll say, than I paid for this. And at that price point, what I wanted to do really isn't economically viable. So instead, what I decided to do is essentially buy a counterfeit Scandinavian machine from China. And I got this thing for about $3,500 plus $3,500 shipping. <laughs> so at a fourth or maybe we'll say a half the price of its Scandinavian counterparts, uh, this thing was just a lot more viable for me to buy for my operation but it does come with some drawbacks. Obviously, it doesn't have the same functionality and features that uh, a more sophisticated model would have. For one thing, a lot of the Scandinavian models have, I think what they're, what they're called, uh, Robinson drives. They're basically hydraulic gears that uh, press against the two wheels here and can 
drive the trailer forward, giving the entire thing four wheel drive. It also isn't engineered for, uh, you know, the most lightweight materials. So the frame here might be a tad over engineered and there's just some, you know, spare metal here and there that probably doesn't have to be there. For example, this bunk can technically hold a cord, but a cord is about 2.5 tons. So I probably won't load this thing fully. I might test it once, um, but probably it shouldn't be loaded to the very top. And so you might be able to take six inches off these pipe here and there. There's a good, uh, you know, two feet of spare, uh, spare frame up by the hitch, which adds weight. Um, there's just kind of spare metal here and there, and you can find some ways that it could have easily been kind of cut off to save weight. That said, at the end of the day, you're talking about a hydraulic machine with a giant crane, so it is going to be heavy. So we're back here towards the tongue, and um, we can see we have our directional control valves here and uh, the engine is right here. And then we have, like I was saying earlier, a good two, two and a half feet between the ball and the base of the DCV. So the problem with this is that this extra two and a half feet uh, dramatically reduces the maneuverability. If that back axle and the back axle of the ATV are a little closer, it could more easily maneuver and uh, you know, a uh, shorter turning radius, etc. The reason they put this here was because they wanted to make this a little more versatile. A lot of the machinery in Scandinavia, it's really designed specifically for ATVs. This is, you know, more all purpose. If you have a small tractor, um, if you have something else, um, they want to make sure that you can use it with it without much modification. And so this just makes it more universally applicable if you put these, this apparatus on the trailer itself. What a lot of the Scandinavian systems do is they take the DCV, they put it on the back of the ATV, and they put, take the engine and they put it on the front of the ATV. So that way you're getting a little more traction to the front of the ATV, um, which helps for four wheel drive. And also you can just turn around and uh, use the control valves from your ATV. So you just have to flip around instead of getting off. So the reason they put this here and they put the two feet here is so you'd actually have room to use the controls. You know, you're not cramped up here, which can be dangerous if the, uh, you know, machine jiggles at all and you're kind of already kind of pinched. Uh, they don't want that. So I understand the logic, but I think I would honestly prefer if the control valves were on the back. I might modify that in the future, but you'd have to, it would actually be a pretty big project because I'd have to adjust the hose sizes. So I'd have to buy a lot of hoses. Um, I'd have to do quite a few things. Also, some of those Scandinavian systems, they actually have uh, two cylinders on each side with like a, a crossbar. So you can actually hydraulically pivot the trailer, which makes that more maneuverable and uh, easy to back up and such, which actually makes it more mechanically similar to an actual forwarder, because that's how forwarders turn. Uh, it's hydraulically pivoted. So like I said, the Scandinavian models are infinitely more sophisticated. This is essentially a Chinese knockoff, um, but it was cheap. It was something that I could actually get my hands on, whereas I might not have been able to with the Scandinavian system. And um, yeah, it's a good starting point for the sort of stuff I wanna do. So we'll see how it works. Let me give you a demo now. I'm sure you're all waiting for that.
so yeah that's basically how it works obviously i have a lot of practice to do i'm not very good but i'm starting to get the hang of it compared to yesterday but there is one last thing i want to talk about um and that is importing machinery so as you probably could have guessed i got this from alibaba and this is not my first time working directly with chinese manufacturers but let me tell you it never gets any less interesting so my first time importing goods was actually uh, with one of my previous businesses that I actually recently sold earlier this summer, this summer, um, and I was getting custom packaging for the product I was selling. And so the great benefit there was that we were still at the time dealing in pretty small volumes, but we wanted custom packaging, and we were able to get it at a price that simply wouldn't have been possible at the volumes we are doing had we were using a US manufacturer, right? So we had to really slim down the width of the cardboard and get the dimensions right in order to optimize the shipping prices. So it was really great that we were able to get that packaging uh, at a very good price per unit while we were still dealing in very small volumes. It's great for kind of small scale businesses, small scale manufacturers, et cetera, because you don't have to be dealing in a great deal of scale to get that much of an economic benefit or even to have the manufacturers work with you because in the US a lot of the bulk manufacturers don't even want to deal with you unless you're talking you know units of hundreds of thousands but there's a lot of problems that comes along with trying to um, you know work with a manufacturer that doesn't speak your language and you know frankly comes from an economy with a culture that isn't necessarily geared towards uh, we'll say quality it is not exactly consumer focused so weird little luxuries that are associated with consumer satisfaction that we're used to in the United States you're just not going to get it. Let me explain what I mean. So when you're importing something, one of the most important items is the bill of lading, which is essentially a receipt of goods at the port. Um, this is the chain of custody document that tells you that the uh, ship has taken on the goods at port and it's going to a certain port of destination, and then you need that bill of lading in order to retrieve your goods. At the same time, Alibaba has a trade guarantee system or something like that where if your product is not dispatched on time, you get an automatic 10% uh, discount, which is capped at $100, which in this case wasn't that much. Um, but you know, it's, it's something. And I really, it was very important to me that this item was shipped within that deadline. So I was kind of bugging them about it, asking them when it was gonna be done. And you know, in the summer, there was some pretty intense heat in the Shanghai region. And um, they were actually closed down for a little bit because you couldn't work in the heat. And I understand that, okay. But then, you know, August came around and they had told me that the item had shipped. And I got the bill of lading. It told me the vessel it was on, which port it left at, what time it left. Great. They submitted that to Alibaba. It was within the deadline. Everything was fine. Then they gave me a tracking number that cited a different vessel, a different port of departure, and a different port of destination. So I was like, huh, that's weird. I was talking to the manufacturer about it. And, uh, you know, they were telling me, don't worry, you know, it was just a change of ships. Um, happens all the time. And I started looking more into it. And uh, no, that, that wouldn't have happened like that. You know, the bill of lading is very important for international trade. It's governed by international law. And the, then I started to look into it more. And the bill of lading was submitted two hours before the deadline where I would have been eligible for a little bit of a refund. And that bill had stated that the ship carrying this trailer had left the port before the trailer had actually reached the port. So it wasn't about ships changing, um, it was essentially just a fraudulent bill of lading. And they had kind of fabricated that just so they could avoid uh, paying that fee because of the late dispatch. Now, to be perfectly clear, I really didn't care. I just wanted an accurate bill of lading to know which ship it was on, what the port of destination was, and when I could actually expect this thing to arrive. And so I literally fought with the manufacturer for a month because I knew that they had just fabricated it, they knew they had fabricated it, and uh, they just weren't going to admit it. So every time I told them that I wanted an accurate bill of lading with the accurate um, details, they would just, you know, in the wrong font, just kind of copy and paste on a different detail onto the fake bill of lading. But, uh, you know, it still, still wasn't accurate, and I just needed to know what the real situation was. So I went to Alibaba and, uh, you know, filed a dispute. And again, my main concern was just getting the accurate details of when this thing was going to arrive. And Alibaba tells me that 
Basically, because there's a pandemic, I couldn't expect on-time dispatch. <sighs> okay, well, whatever. That wasn't my concern. So after Alibaba had pretty much said that I was ineligible to get any sort of a refund, I went back to the manufacturer and, you know, maybe now that there's no risk, um, they'd, they'd give me the original bill of lading. Well, no, they still wouldn't do that. So I essentially had no idea when this thing was coming and it was very nightmarish for about a month. That said, again, at the end of the day, that's just kind of a customer service thing. It still came, it's still, you know, as expected, maybe, you know, one or two details are a little off, but honestly, it could have just been a language thing. So the question is, do I really have much of a right to complain? That, to be perfectly honest, is kind of how the Chinese system works. And um, I was playing games in the Chinese system, so that's kind of what I should just expect. And if you do anything of this sort, that's what you should expect too. So, uh, my advice to you is this, if you do do anything on Alibaba, whether you want, you see this, you think it's cool, you want to buy one of these, um, or you have some other business venture where you want to, you know, import custom products or whatever, um, here are my rules of thumb. Anytime you add any sort of customization, you're going to dramatically increase the chances of complication. If you just order a standard product, expect six months delivery. Just expect six months delivery. I ordered this thing in late June, and it just came to me now. It was about five months for this thing to be delivered. The next thing is make sure you spend a lot of time shoring up the contract before you actually pay money. Copy and paste the specifications of the goods onto the contract, um, reiterate shipping deadlines, anything you need to do on the contract. If it says it three times, that's no problem. That just helps protect you. Alibaba, at the end of the day, makes their revenue from suppliers. They are biased towards suppliers, but they still understand the importance of the consumer. So if the contract is written very clearly and it states something you know once twice three times you should be pretty good it's that vague stuff that's really going to get you that said if you're doing any business over i'll say fifteen thousand dollars and especially if you're ordering multiple units just buy a ticket and go to china and meet with the manufacturer in person tickets like a thousand dollars it's absolutely worth it in the long run plus you get a cool little trip out of it finally um you know the mini excavators you might have seen on YouTube are getting pretty popular. A lot of people are buying those mini excavators and you hear them complain about like having to go to port and go to customs um, and all this other stuff. That really shouldn't be necessary. I mean, it might with some manufacturers, but most are pretty happy to do what's called DDP trade terms, which just means that um, the manufacturer handles all of that. They outsource that to a freight forwarder. The freight forwarder takes care of um, the customs clearance. They take care of transporting it from port to your house. You are going to pay a premium for that, of course, but in my opinion, it's well worth it. Uh, it's a huge headache to have to deal with all that stuff yourself. Um, and if you are not skilled or knowledgeable about it, uh, you could be in way over your head. So it's probably just best to do the DDP trade terms unless maybe you live right on in a port city, you know, close to New York, um, Charleston, something like that, LA. But in any situation, just be sure to do your research. Uh, I actually did have a lot of fun. Uh, I got so involved because of the problems of the bill of lading. I <laughs> researched a lot about the uh, maritime industry and the uh, global trade, and uh, it was really fascinating. I feel like I walked away with a lot more knowledge and understanding of how that system works than I did before, even though this isn't my first time importing. Um, so, you know, just do a couple days of research, understand exactly how these processes work, and uh, you'll be glad you did. But just understand, like I said, that China is very much a Soviet-style economy and it's not geared towards customer service or, um, you know, those sort of luxury things. It's more, you get what you pay for and you don't pay much, so you're not going to get much. And that's not to say the, the goods are necessarily bad quality. There are a lot of Chinese manufacturers that produce some really high quality goods. If you've seen the drone footage in some of my videos, you know, that's a Chinese company and that drone is absolutely amazing. Uh, the mic I use is from the same company. It's a good quality mic compared to a lot of the other stuff on the market, especially for the price point. Um, so I, I kind of reject the myth that Chinese manufacturing is bad. It's just not governed by the same customs that, you know, the American or European economies might be used to. All right, so that's all for now. I got to head out to the woodlot and do some stuff before we get any more snow. Um, if you want to see more of this, like and subscribe. We have a lot more coming your way. It could be disastrous. We'll see. 
but uh, I'm really excited to get this thing in motion and uh, get those, those logs to the mill. All right, until next time, later. <laughs>